Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, I want to say first that I am really, really delighted to be here and to be given the chance to come. It's been a marvelous opportunity for me already. I feel like I'm being recharged <laughs> after a long sort of absence. I don't often get together with so many people. And it's nice to see old friends and a lot of new friends. And before I start, I also want to say something. I was one of the dancers who were more or less brought up by Margaret Krask. And she brought us along the way entirely on a kind of love path. And anything intellectual, which didn't happen very often, I must admit, but if there was anything intellectual, it was more or less squashed. So, um, <laughs> in other words, I am not able to answer any questions of any depth or anything like that. Okay, maybe superficial things about experiences I've had personally, but I can't do anything else. Um, I came through Margaret Krask, and probably I'm one of the few people that came to Baba because of the bad things I heard about him. <laughs> I, has anyone else done that? This is my claim to fame. Okay. <laughs> now I went to, I was studying dancing in London with a teacher and she thought I should go on to someone better. And Margaret Krask was, of course, the best teacher in London at that time. This was in the 30s before the war, and I was about eight or nine. And my teacher was a very smart lady. She sent me to Margaret Krask so that I could take a lesson with her, and then I would go back to the teacher and she would say, all right, what did you learn? And <laughs> so that's the whole reason for that. Obviously, Baba was behind that. But when I got to Margaret Krask, I was not quite advanced enough for her, I was turned over to someone called Mabel Ryan, who I expect you've heard of. Have you? She was also a Bible lover. I fell instantly in love with her. She was quite a marvelous person, and I was scared to death of Miss Crash. <laughs> I'm not anymore, but uh, only on occasions. <laughs> But, um, so Mabel Ryan was my teacher, and I heard, I think, about Baba through my mother, who was terribly, terribly against him, because she heard all these stories from other mothers about how Baba was taking their money, you know, they worked so hard for the ballet school, and he was taking their money and hypnotizing them and doing all this. And, of course, he had been over in London a short while before that, and there'd been quite a lot in the papers, and a lot of it was rather negative. So my mother was always saying to me, it's fine, you know, you'll hear all this stuff about this barber person, but don't pay any attention, because obviously this is not the thing to do. So um, naturally, at that age, you're intrigued by things that you're told not to do. <laughs> so this sort of always... It interested me, but I didn't do anything about it, and neither Mabel Ryan nor Miss Krask ever said anything to me about it. But then um, uh, Mabel Ryan died, and this was very upsetting to me, and of course my mother blamed that on Baba too. You know? <laughs> no, she did. She. Uh, um, well, I can understand that. She was brought up at a certain time in a certain way, and this was all very strange to her. But Mabel Ryan died of cancer, and it was because she went out to India. You know, this was the whole reason. So <laughs> I was very upset, and I didn't believe that story, except something about she had one lipstick which she was saving because they couldn't go out and buy anything. And I can't tell you why she wrote that, except there was probably nothing else that she could say to me because I didn't know anything about, you know, what she was doing. Then um, a long time later, well, it would be what, the war was 39 to 46, right? 
Uh, meanwhile, I was in the ballet company. Had nothing to do with Miss Klask at all. But then after the war, I came over here to dance in Oklahoma. And my mother said, being a smart lady, go and look at Miss Klask because she's over there and she'll be able to help you. <laughs> So I did, not just for that reason, but I wanted to see her again. And she was with Ballet Theatre at that time. She was Ballet Mistress, now known as ABT. And um, so I went round to the stage door, and apparently, I don't remember this, but Ms. Krauss said, the first thing I said was, tell me about Barbara, which is possibly true. I'm sure if she said it, it's true. I wouldn't argue with anything she said. So. <laughs> Uh, so I went up to her room in the Laurelton, which she still had, and saw pictures of Barbara, and she told me a little bit about it, and um, she told me right off, you have to be absolutely sure this is what you want to do. This is what I think someone said yesterday. I forget, was it Phyllis? I think it was Phyllis. Because it's not going to be easy. In fact, it's going to be just the opposite. You know, it's going to be very, very hard, and once you're hooked, you're hooked. So I said, um, no, it was what I wanted to do, but I didn't have any great revelations or anything. I was still just basically interested, and I, I did have some doubts. But um, she gave us always the discourses to read. In fact, she made us memorize them. <laughs> Part, no, part of them, not the whole thing. <laughs> Just part of them, you know, where you go through the rock and the worm and the, the, this all this bit, the creative part. So I memorized it and I thought it was rather peculiar. And um, <laughs> But obviously later I realized it was a meditation. It really didn't have anything to do with learning the discourses. It was a meditation on Bhava. And then you had to go back and repeat it to her which was not a great deal of fun, but um, I guess it worked. So um, I went along with that, and um, but still nothing particular. I know a lot of people who just see a picture of Barbara, and I'm sure a lot of you belong to that group, and they recognize him immediately, and that's it. Like, how many people have done that? Yeah, a lot, see? Well, I didn't. <laughs> I, guess I was a doubting Thomas. I had these doubts at the back of my mind because I had been drawn to pictures and like the New Testament pictures of Jesus Christ and things and I had at the back of my mind supposing this is a false prophet and I'm doing entirely the wrong thing you know and I'll be damned forever so, <laughs> so I was sort of had one foot in both camps I would say and I got family letters, and I think finally, when I got closer to Bauer, was actually when I came out here. And I met, um, I, don't, I went to somebody's house and saw a movie, which didn't do much for me either. But I met Ruth White and um, Agnes Barron, and I started going up to Mearmount a lot. Uh, I went up, I observed all the things like silence days and all the rules and things. And um, I always went up to Mearmount for fasts and silences and things like that. And I was getting closer and closer and then I was back in New York in 52, all right, when Barbara came over. and. For some reason, I can't tell you why, I had been out of work for a long time and I had no money and I'd finally got a job in summer stock, which is not the greatest job in the world, but it was a job. And Barbara was coming over and I had a chance to see him and I didn't take it. And the funny thing about that was we had somebody, I was at the Metropolitan Opera House in the school and somebody there who had nothing to do with Barbara, and we didn't even particularly like her very much, she came to me and offered me the money to go down to Myrtle Beach and meet him. And 
I turned it down, right? And I felt guilty about that for a long time afterwards. I think there were only four dancers that went to see him at that time, and that was the four, the, the aeroplane ride, have you heard that story? Yeah. yeah. And um, I knew some of them quite well. Right, like Tex I knew fairly well, and Zebra and Skipper, and I didn't know the other one too well, so her. But anyway, that went past, and I'd missed that opportunity. But I think it linked up later. You'll see when I get around to some of these stories later that Baba was doing something to me. I figured at the time I wasn't ready, and that was that, you know. So then I was working away, and 56 came around, and I was out here. And I figured, all right, this time I wasn't going to mess it up again. <coughs> So I went back to New York, and I met him at LaGuardia Airport. And the only thing I thought, he came out of the... Well, LaGuardia at that time was not like LaGuardia now. It was um, like a bunch of Quonset hats. Do you remember when it was like that? And <laughs> he came out with the mandalay and through. There were a lot of people there, and he came between the people. And the first thing I thought was how small he was. And this is a funny thing about Baba, because one day he would look terribly small, and another day he would look terribly tall. And that day, I guess, to me, he looked very, very small. And he came between the people, and... Oh, I forgot to tell you something right from the beginning, but I'll tell you in a minute. He, um, he came between the people, and he pointed to me. He got... I think I was on one side of the aisle, so to speak, and Miss Krask was on the other. And he pointed to me, and then he pointed to Miss Krask, and then he pointed back at me. And we never really figured out what that meant, except now I think possibly I do. And that was the part I left out at the beginning. In the 30s, when I first heard of Barbara, Miss Krask had a picture of me in her flat, which is the same as an apartment over here. And Baba went to the flat, and he saw a picture of me, and he wanted to know who I was. And apparently he was interested in finding out more about me. So now possibly that links up with the LaGuardia thing, where he was pointing at both of us. That's the only thing I can think. But that was my first link with Baba, was back in the 30s when he saw the picture. Um, so then we get 56. And um, that was the meeting, was at the airport, and he went back to the Delmonico Hotel, and we all got to meet him there. And that was the first time, I think, when I met him individually, that that finally sealed the whole thing. And we met him one by one at the Delmonico. We were introduced. I was introduced by Miss Krask, of course. And like Charles said about his meeting Baba individually last night. That was probably the longest walk. <laughs> they always were, I don't know why. But um, I walked all the way up, and when I got to Baba, that was it. You know, I mean, there were no more doubts. I felt that was what the whole thing had been about, and it didn't matter what happened after that. I mean, th there was no future. I didn't care about the future, and the past was all gone. You know, that was just... That was it. And of course I cried, and I was probably known as the best crier out of the entire group. <laughs> I mean, I cried almost nonstop. All of 56 and 58. <laughs> Which uh, maybe got rid of a few things. I suppose that's the reason for it. I hope it is. And. Um, then I think my first really exciting moment was I was in the Delmonico. I was talking to Adele and Phyllis about this the other day because I can't remember which one of them it was, and they can't either. I was in the coffee shop because we'd been dismissed for a while while Baba was upstairs in his room, presumably resting or seeing individual people. And I was in the coffee shop with somebody called uh, Naomi. And... Um, Either Adele or Phyllis came running in and said, Baba wants to see the dancers immediately upstairs. 
So of course we dropped everything. We didn't pay for the coffee. We went back later and paid for the coffee. <laughs> and the two of us rushed upstairs and Barbara's door was open. One of the mandalite was standing outside to make sure nobody went in. And so we said, Baba wants to see the dancers. And he said, no, he doesn't. So we said, well, we got the message that he did. And um, the man Lee said, no, there was no such message sent out. So we were standing there wondering what to do, but Baba was at the end of his room and he could see us. So he beckoned us in. So whether that was a plot or a lucky chance, I don't know. But Miss Krask was in there with him, so the two of us went in and sat down on the floor and he asked us each a little bit, a bit about ourselves and he asked me if I was a dancer and I said I was and he said, are you a good dancer? Which was, I was always very introverted, I think I still am. <laughs> But uh, to be asked if I was a good dancer was very embarrassing somehow. But I had to say I was because Miss Krask was there and she said I was first. So <laughs> it was sort of done for me. And he said, will you dance for me? And being still embarrassed and confused, I thought he meant was I going to hop up on my toes right there and then in his bedroom which was not what you know. And I said, well, I haven't got my shoes with me. You know? <laughs> but I was, looking back, I was always doing stupid things like that. But I think we, most of us did at one time or other because everything was so heightened that you tended to get very confused. You know, you were living on a, an entirely different kind of level than what you normally did. So I said, um, of course, you know, I would when the time came. And then he sent us out. And then I went back to Naomi, this Naomi person, Westervelt, was staying in the hotel. And um, I went back to her bedroom with her. And at that time, I got a telegram. This links up with, I think, in 52 when I didn't go to see him. I got a telegram from Agnes DeMille, who you may know is a very well-known choreographer, and she's the one that brought me over here. She did Oklahoma and Carousel and all those shows. And she also did ballets for um, ballet theater. And there was one called Rodeo. And the lead part in that, I think, was the one part in my entire dancing career that I really, really wanted to do. I mean, I've done a lot of parts that I didn't like so much and some that I did, but this was the one part I really wanted to do. So I got this telegram from her saying, would I come and do it with Ballet Theatre on their tour to Russia? It was their first tour to Russia. And you see, I had to say no, because <laughs> probably if I'd gone in 52, maybe this wouldn't have happened. But it did happen. and. Um, I'm glad it did because it meant a lot more to me in a way than the other would have. And it, I didn't mind a bit. I mean, there was a brief moment where I thought, you know, how great it would have been. And then I thought, well, it was great to be offered it. And what I was doing was greater still. And so I had to turn it down. And she was very, very mad. And, um, and she can get very mad. And I heard later that she, she'd she been asking around, why had I ever done a thing like this? And she'd heard stories, I suppose, because her version of it was, I had gone down to South Carolina with a rich lover. <laughs> Which, of course, was absolutely true. <laughs> but it wasn't, wasn't what she had in mind at all. And I don't know, <laughs> she's had, I think after that, an, an enormous amount of sort of contacts with Baba in funny ways. And she's still getting them because a lot of the dancers worked for her and she's heard about Baba off and on. And in fact, she even read Miss um, Krask's book recently that one of the more recent dancers gave to her to read. 
And she doesn't think too much of all this, but she's had a lot of contact with him. Um, so uh, that was okay, and we all went down to Myrtle Beach, and we were a little worried because Miss Krask had told us stories about when she traveled with Bava, he would suddenly make her get up and dance, and I had always been terribly afraid of that because of being shy. You know, they'd be in a restaurant in Italy or somewhere, and he'd say, dance, you know. <laughs> and she would have to get up in her street clothes and dance in front of all these people. And I thought, if he asked me to do that, I, you know, I wouldn't be able to do it. And so we sort of thought between us of something we could do in case he was going to do this. <laughs> so that we wouldn't look like complete idiots. So while we were down at Myrtle Beach, when we were off moments, we tried to put something together. I taught a little piece, and um, Tex and I had been in a movie together, so we went over one of those dances, and um, our little odds and ends, in case he asked us, but we had no idea that he was going to, but she always said, be ready in case he does. So we had a marvelous time at Myrtle Beach, and um, except for one or two incidents, um, well, no, I, w I won't say that. I, most of the, the not so good incidents were in '58, but we came out. <laughs> we came out here, and um, there was another time where, well, there were t uh, twice where I got completely outfoxed by Barbara because I was staying with the friends I used to live with in North Hollywood. While we were, we were here, Baba was in the hotel and everybody was kind of dispersed and I went back to where I used to live. And I was going to make dinner for the dancers in the group because Baba was supposed to go to a dinner with the Sufis that night, so I figured we were all free. You know, there was no, up, no chance that we would miss him at all because he, had, he was booked somewhere else. So I was cooking dinner and... Um, I was living with a couple, and the, the man said, well, as you're cooking dinner, why don't I go down and pick up the dancers for you, the guests? You know, there was Tex and Marie, and I don't know who else, but I remember those two, Peter, I guess. Uh, so I said, fine, that would be a big help. So he went off, drove down to pick them up. They were staying in the same hotel that Barbara was. When he got there, he found the mandalay rushing around on the sidewalk, sort of frantic, because Baba was supposed to go to this Sufi dinner, and the cabs were on strike. So one of the mandalay came up to Bob and said, um, would you mind driving Baba to this Sufi dinner? <laughs> and so Bob said, he, he wasn't particularly interested in Baba, he said, fine, you know, everybody hop in. So. <laughs> So he got to drive Baba to the dinner, and if I hadn't been cooking dinner up at the other place, it would have been me. <laughs> and so he was actually very excited to have Baba in the car at that point, and then he came back and said, you know, it had been quite an experience, and something went wrong with his car that night, and it was never right again. <laughs> <laughs> they never managed to fix it. Um, the second time I was out foxed, but we all were, we were going to go up to Mearmount, and that's in the movie, I think, of everyone going up to Mearmount. And uh, I thought I was the one with the car because I'd been living here. So I said I'd drive us all up, and if we went very, very early in the morning, we'd get there before everybody else, and we'd have more time to see Baba when he arrived. We'd probably be the only people there, you know, sneaky. So we drove up, and we probably got there. We were supposed to be there at 8, I think, and we got there about 6. And, <laughs> and Agnes Barron rushed out and said, Oh, marvelous, you've come to help me. So <laughs> she put us in the kitchen cutting up fruit for fruit salad. So there we all were, cutting up fruit salad, and Barbara came with everybody else and was talking to everybody else, and we were still in the kitchen cutting up fruit. And we, <laughs> and we just didn't get to see him. 
So that's how things backfire all the time. Um, but that was nice up there too. And then after that we went to, I guess, San Francisco. Meanwhile, Baba had said that he wanted the dancers to dance for him. So it was arranged that we were going to dance in San Francisco. We were staying in the Holiday Inn and we had some sort of frantic rehearsals and we put something together that we, the things we'd been thinking about but we really hadn't had time to practice and we had no costumes or anything but it didn't matter. And let's see, uh, four of us did the Highland Fling. It was all very unsuitable. We did the Highland Fling because that happened to be something I knew. <laughs> and Tex and Skipper did a Spanish dance. Skipper, by the way, is now is Catherine Damon, and she's in Hollywood. I don't know whether you know about that. She was in Soap. She was Mrs. Campbell. So they did a Spanish. She was a dancer back then. So they did a Spanish dance, and Tex and I did the Black Bottom from the movie, and. Peter didn't have anything to do, so he got up and did some ballet combinations. And Barbara seemed to enjoy it very much. And so we were pleased about that. And we did a, very, a few other things. The, another thing I remember very well, which was another of my stupidities, I mean extremely stupid, I was <laughs> very jealous. I was always being jealous of everybody. I think a lot of people were, but I was jealous because <laughs> no, this one got to do this thing for Baba and somebody else would get to do something else for Baba and I wasn't doing anything. You know, I thought one had to do something. You know, it wasn't enough to just love him or anything. He had to actually do something. And Tex had, was making him a jacket, all right? So I thought, all right, I've got to make something too. And I... I couldn't really make anything except I did knit very well. So I thought, I'll knit him a pair of socks. Now, if you can imagine Barbara in a pair of woolen socks. <laughs> but, <laughs> I mean, what could he possibly do with them? I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking of. But anyway, <laughs> this was what I knew how to do. I mean, it was the only thing I knew how to do besides dance, so I started these socks and we went to uh, see an ice show because Barbara loved to go and see shows. Usually when he got there, he would cover his head with a, a blanket or something and he wouldn't see it anyway. But <laughs> <laughs> or else he would, he would get us all settled and then he would get up and leave, you know. But there's, there's some theory, I think, that he liked to have everybody together concentrating on something. I'm sure you've heard that. Concentrating on something else because then he could work on the people. So we went to the ice show and I was sort of watching the ice show and sort of watching him under the blanket or whatever he was <laughs> under. And we got to intermission and I had this sock that was like... Yeah, I was... <laughs> He was leaving the next day and I had to get the socks finished, you know, so I was knitting during the ice show. So I had a sock that was about, no, it must have been that long, and I had to rip it all out. But anyway, I did get the socks finished and the next day he had the dancers in, I think it was separately, it might have been with a few other people, into his room in Holiday Inn. And I was afraid to give the socks to Barbara. So I had given them to, I think it was Adi, or it might have been Meiji, to give to him. And so we went in, there was Baba holding the socks. <laughs> Which made me feel more foolish than ever. <laughs> and uh, he talked to us for a while, and Miss Krask was sitting beside him, and all the time he talked to us, he kept hitting her over the head with these socks. <laughs> That was <laughs> that was uh, my last experience of, of 56, I think, because he left from there and went to Australia, and I was hoping that it was cold in Australia. <laughs> <laughs>
And um, after that, he didn't allow anybody to give him anything. But I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that was really anything to do with me. <laughs> I might have had a small part in that. No, because next time he came, he said it was an order that nobody was to give him anything. Of course, people did anyway. But um, in a way, that was sort of a relief. It took that, you know, that awful thing of wanting to make things or do things for him or off one's mind. Um, I don't want to go over, but I'm not, so I'm all right. Um, then in between 56 and 58, we figured, well, next time he comes, we're going to be a lot more organized. So when we heard he was coming over in 58, we got together and we did rehearse properly. And we got together and we made costumes. And um, we rehearsed in the studios at the Old Met until we were more or less thrown out by, I'd forgotten that part, by Anthony Tudor who didn't think we should be rehearsing something that was for Baba in the opera house. I don't quite know why, but uh, that's the way he felt. So then we had to rent studios and do it somewhere else. And we put together a, a pretty good program, and by then there were more people, because the first time there were only four dancers, I think, and by now we had, must have been eight or 10, there were quite a number. So I rehearsed a sort of condensed version of a ballet I'd done with the Royal Ballet called Patino, which was skating ballet. And we had a French dancer, modern dancer called Jean Sebron, who already had a lot of, he worked solo, so he had a lot of things he could do. And um, Texan Skipper did another Spanish dance, and. Uh, so we were working on all these things, and when the time came, we rented a station wagon and we all stuffed ourselves in there and came rushing down to Myrtle Beach. And we got there and there were a lot of people there at that time and there wasn't room at the center for everybody, so unfortunately we were billeted out, so to speak. Peter Saul and I were put in a hotel in Myrtle Beach the town, which as you know is quite a long way from the center, if you've been there. I mean, it's not walking distance or anything like that. And we felt very, very cut off and were trying to think of ways that we could possibly get there. And on the other hand, there had been a rule put out, I don't think it was Barbara's rule, but it might have been Elizabeth's, but we didn't know about it, that said if you were staying off the center, you should stay off the center until the time when you were supposed to come. But Peter and I were a little more ambitious and <laughs> we thought of all kinds of things. You know, we were going to hitchhike, we were going to ride horses, we were, I don't know what we were going to do. But in the end, we managed to get a ride into the center where the lucky people were. And we rushed in and we found was the guest house, I think, where Miss Krask and Kitty and all those people were sitting. It was supposed to be a quiet time. And we came charging in and said, hi, you know. <laughs> and Miss Krask turned absolutely pale and said, you're not supposed to be here. You've got to get out. So we felt terrible. And Elizabeth, I think, had to drive us back to the hotel. And we felt very, very bad, but we felt a lot worse the next the next day when we came in. We came in at the proper time and Baba saw groups in the lagoon cabin, individual groups. And the dancers were in there. That was our time and he went round each person. I think there were a few more than the dancers because Billy Eaton was also included with us all the time, which was Baba's order. And um, he went round each person and said, how did you sleep, you know? And it took a very long time, and everybody said they'd slept fine and everything. And he didn't say anything to Peter and I, and we were cowering in the corner. <laughs> and he talked about other things, and we were the only two that he never asked how we slept. So you can imagine how we felt. 
And um, finally, right before he dismissed us, he said, uh, you know, how did you sleep? And we said, <laughs> and then he said that he wanted everybody somehow to be accommodated at the center, which was really nice. And I don't know how they did it, but everybody doubled up somehow. And I was very fortunate in being part of, a, of about 10 of us that were allowed to sleep in the lagoon cabin. It was really marvelous. And it was a sort of an assorted group. But this is an instance of how ridiculous things got. Baba said that we had to be out before he got there. We had to be out and the place had to be cleaned up before he got there in the morning. So we always got up very early. And you should have seen the competition you know, to sweep the floor. I'm going to sweep the floor. <laughs> no, I'm going to sweep the floor. <laughs> and everybody was like this, you know. They wanted to be the one that was going to clean up before he got there. Uh, ridiculous. I mean, didn't really matter who cleaned the floor as long as it was clean. And the fact that we were allowed to sleep in there was certainly enough. And I don't think anybody slept very well. And there was one... I always tangled with this one lady from Israel. Um, she tangled with all the dancers, as a matter of fact, because she was a dancer too. And I think she felt left out. You know, she, she did Israeli dancing, and she was always doing Israeli dancing around the center. But you see, she was never asked to dance or anything, and I think she felt left out. But. Um, she was always accusing me of snoring, and I'm sure she was right. She said, I can't sleep because you snore all the time. <laughs> so this is, you know, it's like Miss Krask said about being India. Everybody had, or we always did at the beginning, this sort of marvelous idea of how it would be to live with the avatar. You know, it, it, you sort of float around and... He says marvelous things to you. <laughs> and it wasn't like that. It was just the opposite. Well, you would think that if we were allowed to sleep in the lagoon cabin and be with Baba, that we would all be pretty nice. But we weren't, unfortunately. <laughs> so that was one instance. And um, as usual, of course, Baba pulled a lot of tricks on us. As you know, nothing goes easy when you're doing something specifically for him, and we had this performance, and we went into the barn, we were going to dance it in the barn, and you couldn't dance in the barn because the floor was so slippery. So we went to Elizabeth and said, what can we do about the floor? And she said, well, you can take the finish off the night before, but it all has to be back on as it was right afterwards. <laughs> And well, she was, you know, she was very careful with the floor. And um, dancers do horrible things to floors. I can't tell you. I mean, there have been more complaints from more people about what dancers do. They put coke on the floor to, so they won't slip, or comet, or you know, anything. And obviously, we couldn't do this because it was a beautiful floor. So we were down on our hands and knees the night before taking the finish off which took a very long time, and we had to be careful because we didn't want to spoil the floor. In the meantime, Donald had arrived. He'd been held up because he was dancing with a company. He'd arrived, and he wasn't in the performance because he hadn't had a chance to do anything. So he was more or less put in charge of music. And everything went wrong with that, of course. You know, I don't remember whether it was a, it was a tape, I guess. But he was always running into Myrtle Beach to get some sort of equipment and nothing worked and we had all these problems. And uh, So we got the floor done and that was okay. But then we found that if we entered from, we were entering from the back door of the barn and of course we all had shoes on, ballet shoes or whatever. Or even if you had bare feet, what happened was you brought in sand with you, which was just as bad as having a slippery surface. So 
we had to go through all this bit about taking the shoes off and putting them on <laughs> just when you got there. And it was really altogether very difficult. But when the performance came, um, it really went very well, I think. I mean, I don't know whether we danced well or not. I really have no idea. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I don't think any of us could have said for sure that we did because it was, uh, it was just one of those experiences that never happens again. You know, and um, I figured this was the whole reason I had ever started dancing in the first place. And I think I was wrong, but uh, that's what I figured at the time. And he enjoyed it very much, and he made Jean, the French dancer, who incidentally is back in this country again now. I think that's the is it the first time since then? No, he's been back in between. <coughs> but he hasn't been back for a long time. Um, he made Jean sit down at his feet with his back to him, and there was a very long silence. And I don't know what that was about, but it was, um, you know, one of those strange times one had with Baba where you knew he was working on something, but you didn't know what. And then he made fun of me because I had to do, in the ballet we did, I had to do a lot of turns called fuetes. You know, I, I kept going in, so he, he was going like this <laughs> to me. <laughs> and he thought that was funny. And um, after that, I was a complete and total wreck. Because he said, at the end, you have made me very happy and it suddenly came home to me that, you know, what an extraordinary thing this was to dance for God and for God to tell you that you'd made him happy was, I mean, who would ever dream that such a thing could happen? <laughs> and I had been crying before that, but now I really, <laughs> I really started. I didn't know what I was doing. I was crying and I walked all the way down to the beach and into the water and I think a few people asked me if I was all right, and I said I was, but I really didn't know what I was doing. And then I turned around and walked all the way back. But I decided quite wrongly at that time that I didn't ever want to dance again because this was the sort of, this was the peak, you know, and anything after that would be completely downhill and it would spoil everything. And of course I was wrong again because when we said goodbye to Baba at the airport. He asked me if I was going to go back and dance in something, and I said very firmly, no, I wasn't. I was going to do something else. And, but he asked me again, and he looked rather stern, like he wasn't pleased with what I was saying. So I said, no, I wasn't going to dance again, that I didn't have any offers of jobs, and I had been asked to do some research for Agnes de Mille's book and so forth, and he still didn't look very pleased, and I, I could never figure that out. But um, I think the reason possibly was because I had made up my mind that I was going to stop right there, and this wasn't what he wanted. You know, so of course I did go back and dance again in a terrible show. <laughs> which was what I hadn't wanted to do. <laughs> Terrible show that folded in about two weeks. And um, after that I more or less stopped. But I suppose you get these ideas of what you want to do and then not at all what he wants to do. And he just wanted me to go on dancing or to be in dancing. And of course I still am. I don't dance but I still teach professionally. And. Um, I think, seeing I have another talk in another day or so, that I would like to save the rest of it for that, if that's all right with you. Okay? Say bye.